In this video, we're going to talk about the importance of a good research design. This will be the introduction to sort of a series of videos on research methods, and we have to knock out this really important topic before we get to the other content areas like social psychology and all of that, because all of these content areas use research designs to answer questions about that content area. And so we need to learn why research designs are important and just lay the groundwork of some key research designs we're gonna see over and over again. But in this video, my job is to basically motivate why we care about research designs. And I wanna start by introducing autism spectrum disorder. Now this is a group of complex disorders of brain development, often arising in childhood. It's considered a childhood disorder, but doesn't necessarily have to arise in childhood. And autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, is characterized by deficits in social interaction, deficits in communication, both nonverbal and verbal communication, and characterized by repetitive behaviors or very fixated interests, like trains or insects or whatever, depending on the child. Okay, I won't get too much into autism because we're gonna talk about that later on when we get to psychological disorders, and you probably have some idea about what autism looks like. You might even know someone with autism, but what I will talk about is a little bit of a story of the history of how we treated and helped children with autism. So long ago, many people believed that autism spectrum disorder was purely a motor problem. It was not a cognitive problem in people's minds. The theory was that children with autism had a good brain, but they were sort of trapped in a bad body. They wanted to communicate, for example, but they just couldn't because of some physical limitation. So based on this theory, people developed a way to help children with autism, and this way was called facilitated communication, kind of what you're seeing here. So on the right, we have a child with autism, and you can see a keyboard in which they could type. But again, it's a physical problem. You can't just put a keyboard in front of a child with autism. They don't have sort of the motor ability, again, according to the theory, to coordinate the actions required to type out what they're thinking. And this is where the person on the left comes into play. This is the facilitator, and you can see their job is very simple. All they need to do is hold the arm, just steady the arm of the child, which takes away some of the motor challenges involved in typing. And from this simple sort of intervention, what we saw is that children who were previously mute, who didn't even communicate at all, were now typing out complete sentences. For example, mommy, I want you to know that I love you even though I can't speak sort of bone chilling, right? It's a huge deal. It became a national phenomenon. This was used everywhere because it was a pretty simple intervention and it appeared to be a really, really effective one. But scientists who are skeptical as they should be, uh, basically looked at this and wanted to test to make sure this was actually working as intended. So they devised an experiment to test facilitated communication. We'll talk about experiments in a few videos, but I'll just describe this one in particular for now. So here was the setup, really simple setup. You can see on the right we have the facilitator, on the left we have the child with autism. You can see that they both have a screen in front of them that displays images, and then a center divider which makes it impossible for each person to see the other person's screen. So the child with autism can only see their screen, and the adult facilitator can only see their screen. Okay, so that was the apparatus. Here's how the study worked. The task was really simple. All they were asked to do is for the child to type what he or she was seeing. That's it. So what the facilitator was seeing should have been entirely irrelevant. On 50% of the trials, they did this over and over and over with many diff different images, not just cats and dogs as you're seeing here. So on 50% of, uh, of the trials, excuse me, the pictures were the same. So if it was a cat on the left, it was a cat on the right. Now the key trials though, on the other 50% of trials, the images were different. So if they saw a cat on the left with the you know, child with autism saw, then the adult facilitator saw a dog or again, something different. It wasn't just cats and dogs. Okay, so what were the results of the study? They did this with many different children and facilitators. They did this over and over with lots of different trials. And what they found is that on those trials where the images were the same, the children typed what they saw. That's great. So if it's cat, cat, the child typed cat. 
Okay, check. But let's get to the really important trials. When the images were different, when the child saw a cat and the facilitator saw a dog, the child typed dog. Even though the child couldn't see what was on the facilitator's screen, very consistently, the children with autism were typing what was on the facilitator's screens. So what does this mean? This means that facilitated communication wasn't actually getting children with autism to communicate at all. Instead, the facilitators appeared to be unconsciously, unintentionally guiding the hands of the children to areas on the keyboard that would sort of type what they thought the child would want to say. So we weren't reflecting the children's thoughts at all. Instead, we were just kind of reflecting the facilitator's thoughts. And so obviously this was really discouraging at the time because it sort of debunked facilitated communication altogether. But ultimately this was a really good thing because imagine how much time and money and manpower we would have wasted on facilitated communication had we not done this study. We would have mistakenly believed that this was an effective treatment and again, we would have wasted a lot of time. So now we can focus our attention and our research on finding different ways to help children with autism that are actually effective. Okay, this leads me to one or two quick more topics. Modes of thinking. We as humans have two modes of thinking, system one thinking and system two thinking. Let's start with system one thinking. System one thinking is quick and intuitive thinking that relies largely on gut hunches and heuristics or cognitive rules of thumb to make judgments about the world. So if you're trying to decide what to eat for dinner, for example, system one thinking would say, burgers and pizza, that's what I want. System two thinking, in contrast, is deliberate, slow, and reflective thinking that takes mental effort and time, but results in more analytical conclusions. So in the example of what to eat for dinner, for example, you might say, well, okay, I really want burgers and pizza, but I know that that's not healthy. You know, I want something a little more nutritious. I'm, you know, that conflicts with my goals of trying to lose a couple pounds or whatever. I'm going to eat a salad instead. That's a little, a little more effort, effortful. It's not automatic, but again, leads to a better decision. Let's illustrate with an example. I'm going to ask you a quick question, and I want you to respond after a few seconds. Which is more common? Words in the English language that begin with the letter R or words that have R as the third letter. So what do you think? Well, this study was actually done long ago and replicated many times since then. And what we tend to see is that people far and away assume that words which begin with the letter R are more common. But as you might be able to guess by now, this is an incorrect answer. In reality, words that have R as the third letter are significantly more common. So this is a great illustration of one heuristic called the availability heuristic, which is a mental shortcut that relies on coming up with immediate examples to solve a problem. So for example, it might be something like this. If I can easily recall examples of whatever the question is, then this might be the case, or this must be the case if you're really confident. So when you're answering that question on the previous slide, what you probably tried to do is come up with examples. So it was probably really easy for you to come up with examples of R being in the first position of the word, and it was probably much more difficult to come up with examples as R being in the third position. This is the availability heuristic. It's not the only heuristic we'll see, but it's a big one, and I want to bring it up now as a segue to my conclusion. So here's the conclusion. Here's the point. Without research designs, we see a great increase in system one thinking and in heuristics, the reliance on heuristics. In contrast, with research designs, it forces you to rely on system two thinking, which leads to more accurate conclusions about the world.